James for last, uh, filling in last week. That was um, rather unexpected. It should have been expected. Um, kids were starting to get sick. Though most of the time, we can have something that goes through the house and everybody else gets sick but me. I was hoping it would be that case. I didn't escape. And so, um, so uh, as, uh, as I said, and y'all may have seen this on the text thing, that because um, I wasn't here last week, I'm going to have to make up for it and preach extra long this week. Um, so, um, actually, no, that's not the case. Um, some of y'all still have gifts to wrap, I'm sure. Guys, it's about time to start your shopping. So, I'll go ahead and try to get you out of here early today. This Christmas season, uh, we've been focusing on hope and how it is that Christ is the hope of of humanity. The reason why we can have hope is because of Jesus. So often in our lives, we feel hopeless because uh, our, our, our sinful nature, our prideful hearts, the, the godless culture around us, the fallen world draws us into a self-centered, self-seeking way of thinking. And the fact is, we see hopelessness, meaninglessness, despair uh, on, on such a rise in our culture, in our society, because so many people have turned away from God and that even those who say that they follow after him on a day-to-day -day basis, more often than not, tend to act like God's not there. We live our lives in such a way that it's not focused on him, but rather focused on ourselves. And we see the results of that in society, in culture, as uh, families are on a decline. A lot of young people say that they just don't even see the point. Why bother? Unfortunately, suicide is on the rise, anxiety, depression, all kinds of mental health issues, because people feel cast about. They feel lost. They feel as if life is meaningless, as if they have no value, no hope. We as a people, humanity as a race, has turned away from our creator and instead we have chosen self-gratification and pride, self-centeredness. Adam and Eve in the garden, they didn't just happen to go eat some fruit they weren't supposed to, right? Like, you know, just getting caught with their hand in the cookie jar. It was literally a willful choice to disobey the King of kings and Lord of lords who have said, you can do anything you want. I've given you this world, just don't eat from that one tree. And in that moment that they chose to eat, they rebelled against God. They disobeyed God, and they sought instead to be their own authority, to be their own God. And life for mankind became self-centered, turned inward on our own hearts. And self-centeredness is a life defined where you are the main thing. You are the purpose. You are the focus. You are the arbiter of what is right, what is good. You set the rules. You decide what is right or wrong, what is good or bad. You live for your own happiness, and everything is about you. And so often this is how we live. And indeed, many of the things that we do that are the good and right things to do, we do out of self-interest, often not because it just is the right thing to do. This kind of life, self-centered, self-focused living, creates despair. There is a lack of purpose or meaning because what purpose or meaning could there be given to you whenever it's just all about you? It, it, it sounds good on a surface level to say that you get to decide what your life is about. But purpose and meaning is something that you cannot create for yourself. It is designed into you by your creator. And if you have dismissed the creator, then what meaning or purpose could your life have? It causes despair when we focus on ourselves because there's no redemption. We know that we are flawed. We know that we are broken. That the sinful things we do comes from a broken and fallen heart. And it is something that we do not have the ability to fix in ourselves. So if it's all about us and all up to us, what hope could there be for redemption? If there is no God, when we're focused on ourselves, then we're alone. And we are of no value. 
what value or worth or purpose, how could we matter when there is no God? See, because we tend to find our value and whether or not we matter in others. But as most of us know, as we have experienced through life, as we put our hope in other people, as we determine our value and our worth based on how others view us, it is all too easy to be let down. However, because of the babe that was born and lain in that manger, we have hope that we do not have um, a lack of purpose and meaning, but rather God, our creator, gives us our meaning. As we see the prophecies of Christ that said, here's the story that is going on. This is the tale that God is unfolding and you have a place in it. That there's something bigger than you are that you are a part of. We see in the deity of Christ that because he is God, he is the offended party. He is able to forgive. And as God, he has the power to heal our broken hearts. And because of the humanity of Christ that he draws close, as scripture says, we have a high priest who knows what it is like. For he was tempted in all ways as we are. And lastly, the love of Christ shows that we do indeed matter that we can rest secure in the value and worth that we have. So how is that? How is it that just because he loves us, then we can have hope? Well, according to the world's definition of love, love is, as you would expect from a fallen, prideful, selfish world, focused on the self. It's all about, are you happy? Typically, whenever we say to someone, I love you, what we usually mean is, you make me happy. Or maybe with a slightly, you know, more charitable bent, we mean I want to make you happy. But it's all still centered on the fickle, whimsical emotions that are temporary and easily shaped and changed. We may feel like we are valuable because someone loves us in this manner, but then what happens whenever our feelings change? Or what happens whenever they decide they don't love us anymore? If if our sense of value and worth, if if the idea that we matter in this life is based on other people's fleeting appreciation of who and what we are, or even based on our own emotions, which can change and shift and come and go, we realize we don't, or at least we get a sense that we don't really matter after all. Some of y'all may have had a similar experience as I did whenever I was a kid. I was a socially awkward, weird little kid, and not much has changed. Um, It's really easy to get a sense of, I don't matter, what's the point, life isn't worth it, whenever no one seems to like you. And so whenever we base our worth and our value on the whimsical, temporary, malleable feelings of, our, of others, including ourselves, then we can wrestle with, do we actually value, have value, do we matter at all? And when you think of it in this sense, you can see how we actually cheapen what love is whenever we think of it in terms of happiness that temporary fleeting feeling of good. I mean, it's not a bad thing. God created that feeling, that sensation, that part of us. We are social creatures who desire and flourish whenever we have that community and that relationship and people who do value and do care about us. But that is not the key thing on which our value is based. Because that's about just making you happy. And life is not about just being happy. So how is it then that the love of Christ can give us that sure foundation of knowing that we matter? Because the love of Christ is not based on being happy. It's not based on shifting emotions that come and go. And the love of Christ never changes. Because he is God, and God cannot change. 
Because Jesus is God, he does not change, and therefore his love for you cannot change. Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he loves you today, he'll still love you tomorrow. And you can rest secure in that fact. James chapter 1, verse 17 says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Again, if he loves you today, he'll have that same love for you tomorrow. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says if we are faithless, he remains faithful and cannot deny himself. That even as your obedience and your love for him ebbs and flows and wanes, he does not change. So I heard it said once, you cannot out the love of God. See, people will let you down. You, you can actually behave in such a way where people will say, no, nope, I'm not putting up with that. And they will walk away. But God says he doesn't change. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. The love of God isn't based on you and your behavior. He loves you even though. So our value is not based on the fickle emotions of other, others. If our value and worth is grounded in the love of Christ and that he has for us, then we can rest secure in the knowledge that we really do matter. Because it doesn't matter how many other people point at you and say, you don't matter, you're worthless. If the King of kings and Lord of lords who created you said, no, you matter to me, then you matter. And you have value and you have reason for hope. But it's not merely that Christ's love for us doesn't change. It's the type of love. It's what God's love for us actually is. It's a different thing than how the world defines love about just being happy. Christ does not love as the world loves. It's not something superficial about how he just wants you to feel a certain way. Love based on emotions can wane, it can ebb, it can flow, it can come, it can go, it can change. Emotions come and go. And any sense of being loved that is based on emotions can come and go with it. But true love, the love that Christ has for you, is conveyed in how he gives of himself. That's what love is. How do you give of yourself for others? At the heart of what biblical love is, is sacrifice. I've used this illustration before. Um, if any of y'all have ever gone into kind of... Uh, self-help, motivational speaker kind of seminar, or maybe read a book on marriage or did some kind of marriage counseling thing, chances are at some point, someone probably said something along the lines of, how do you spell love? Love is spelled T-I-M-E. Because love is giving of yourself for the other person, and there is almost nothing as more valuable that you possess in this life than time. Because once you've given it, you can never get it back. It's one of the most precious things that you have, and what you are willing to give your time for shows where your value is, shows what you care about. If you think of the love that parents have for a child, and how it is shown in the sacrifices that parents will make to provide for their children. Those of you who have kids or have raised kids, you know well that there are things that you would love to have, that you want to have in your life. But if you choose that, then that's something you can't give to your kids. And so you retool your life, you do things a different way, and you give up something of your own so that you can provide for them. Because that's what love is. The love of Christ is shown and how he sacrifices for us. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
over and over and over again. The Bible says, how is it that God loves us? How has he shown his love for us? It's not in the fickle sense of emotions and how we feel from one moment to the next. Rather, it's in the sacrifice that he has made. When we base our value on emotions that come and go, there are times whenever you think, well, I don't feel like God loves me. Well, he's already shown you that he does, whether you feel it or not. When we base our value on the emotions that ebb and flow of fallen human beings, including ourselves and our own emotions, then we have no sure basis to know that we matter, that we have value, and that our lives are worth something. But when we see that our value and worth is grounded in the love that Christ has for us, then no matter how we feel, or no matter how others may treat us, or how the ups and downs of life can throw us to and fro, we can still rest assured and know that we do matter, that, that we have value, that our life contains worth. Christ's love for us has been unquestionably demonstrated on the cross. As he went to the cross to pay the price for your sins, he showed how much he loves. And we have no worry of that love ever being lost because he cannot change. If God loves you today, he will continue to love you tomorrow. And he has already shown you that he loves you by paying for your sin on the cross. So it cannot change. Whatever may come your way, whatever ups and downs of life, whatever insults and vitriol may be hurled at you from the world, but whatever emotions may well up inside of you cannot change the fact of the love that God has. Even in this fallen and broken world, knowing that we rest in the unchanging love by the King of kings and Lord of lords, we have reason to hope. In a world where your worth and value is based in the fickle, whimsical, temporary emotions of human beings, there is no sure sense of hope. But when the sovereign creator, King of kings and Lord of lords says, you matter, then there is nothing in heaven and earth that can make it otherwise. And therefore, we have reason to hope because the sovereign creator of all things, the author of life who gave you breath, stepped out of heaven and became that baby in the manger who would grow up to be the man on the cross who shows once and for all the love that God has for you. That little church on Liberty Hill. Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty Hill.